Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks, what is hoarding disorder and how can it be differentiated from obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive personality disorder? Other questions would be, does hoarding disorder have a relationship with autism spectrum disorder? And what is the treatment for hoarding disorder? So first, let's take a look at the definition of hoarding disorder as we see it in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. So we have several criteria here that have to be met for a diagnosis of hoarding disorder. So criterion A, we see persistent difficulty discarding possessions regardless of value. Now I've seen a wide range of possessions here used to meet this particular criterion. We see a lot of products made of paper. That's fairly common, like newspapers, magazines, books, and mail. I've also seen other things like plastic bags, plastic products of other types, boxes are somewhat common, like cardboard boxes, and every now and then we see something like clothing or even hoarding animals. Moving on to criterion B, here we see that the difficulty that we see with criterion A is due to a perceived need to save the items and to distress associated with discarding those items. So they want the item and they have difficulty getting rid of the item. And there's a lot of different reasons for this. Utility is one reason, like they believe the item is useful. We also see aesthetic value. They believe the item has some sort of value in terms of artistic value, beauty, something like that. We see sometimes a strong sentimental attachment, even to objects like newspapers and magazines. We see that somebody doesn't want to be wasteful, so they feel guilty about getting rid of something because that item may have some sort of value. And we also see a concern about losing valuable information. I see this a lot when it comes to something like the mail or newspapers, right? Somebody gets a lot of mail over their lifespan and they're worried they're going to need one of those letters or documents later on. Now this behavior, this accumulation of all these different products is intentional and not passive. Some people do accumulate things more or less by accident. They just hold on to things and they just find later on they have a lot of that. That's not what's happening here. Again, there's an intentional component to it. Moving on to criterion C. The difficulty results in the accumulation of possessions that congest or clutter active living areas and substantially compromises their intended use. So people have difficulty moving around their house or apartment and they can't use the items that they are hoarding. If living areas are uncluttered, it's only because of third-party intervention, like family members. So somebody can still meet criterion C if the family members cleaned out the cluttered areas. So activities of daily living, like getting dressed, cooking, or making one's way from room to room, these activities can become difficult or impossible with all the clutter. I've seen some incredible levels of congestion associated with hoarding disorder. Stacks of newspapers and magazines or just narrow pathways were available. And if the stacks of paper would collapse, it could actually be pretty dangerous. So the pathways are really just extremely narrow and somebody's kind of making their way through and all these stacks of papers and magazines are shaking and kind of moving toward the middle. So again, it can get a little bit scary. I've seen situations where the subflooring of a house is actually cracked under the weight of magazines, newspapers, and books. And similarly, situations where walls were damaged from these items leaning against them. And again, all that weight and pressure. I've seen situations where rooms of a house were completely inaccessible due to clutter. I remember this one situation where boxes of newspapers were in a basement and there were so many that you couldn't even move down the steps at all. You couldn't even hit the first step going down into the basement. Now sometimes hoarding behavior gets confused with collecting. Like a lot of these items people think, well maybe somebody would collect those types of items like magazines. Well collecting is typically organized and systematic. Although the quantity of products may be similar to what we see with hoarding disorder. With collecting, people also usually display items to interested parties. Usually this doesn't happen with hoarding. Somebody with hoarding disorder typically doesn't want to show people the books or magazines or newspapers. Now moving to criterion D, here we see that this difficulty, right, keeping all these different products in the house and not getting rid of them, causes clinically significant distress. So functioning has to be affected. 
If functioning is not affected, the diagnosis is not given. Now, it's important to remember here, though, if somebody has poor insight, they may not report distress, even though that distress is actually happening. Now, with criterion E, we see that the difficulty is not attributable to a medical condition, like a brain injury. And with criterion F, we see that it's not explained by symptoms of another mental disorder, like obsessive compulsive disorder, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, or autism spectrum disorder. Now here's where it gets a little bit confusing. Hoarding disorder can actually be comorbid with OCD, even though it doesn't seem like it from this particular criterion. For both disorders to be diagnosed, the hoarding symptoms have to be independent of the OCD symptoms. So those are the diagnostic criteria for hoarding disorder. We also see several specifiers. One popular specifier is with excessive acquisition. So this is when an excessive number of items are coming in. It's not just a failure to get rid of stuff, right? So we see that 80 to 90% of people with hoarding disorder meet this specifier. And a lot of times the excessive acquisition is due to obtaining free items. So what this really comes down to is that you can accumulate items normally, right? Everyone gets mail. Most people would get newspapers, magazines, or books at some time in their life. And if you never throw anything away, that can cause accumulation. When we're talking about the excessive acquisition specifier, someone's actively obtaining new items. They're going out and they're finding stuff and bringing it back, usually, to their residence. The other specifiers have to do with insight, and better insight is associated with a better prognosis. So the first insight specifier is with good or fair insight. Here a person recognizes that the hoarding related beliefs and behaviors are problematic. Then we have with poor insight, the person is mostly convinced that the beliefs and behaviors are not problematic. And then the last insight specifier is with absent insight delusional beliefs. And here we see that the person is completely convinced that the hoarding related beliefs and behaviors are not problematic. Now I mentioned animal hoarding before. This particular type of hoarding is associated with poor insight and an increased risk of unsanitary conditions. Now how about some of the characteristics we see associated with hoarding disorder? Well we see perfectionism, avoidance, being disorganized, procrastinating, being highly distractible, and indecisive, which is an interesting mix because perfectionism is associated with high conscientiousness, but of course indecisiveness and being disorganized is associated with low conscientiousness. Overall though, individuals with hoarding disorder tend to have low conscientiousness. They also tend to have high extroversion, which is kind of surprising because we wouldn't think that extroversion would be related to hoarding disorder at all. And they tend to have high eroticism, this part isn't really that surprising. So how about the general course of the disorder? How does it tend to come about and what tends to happen over the lifespan? Well, we see that hoarding disorder actually tends to begin relatively early in the lifespan, usually the late 20s, and it worsens across the lifespan. However, about 25% of people report an onset after the age of 40. Someone over the age of 55 is at three times the risk to have hoarding disorder as compared to somebody between the ages of 34 and 44. Individuals with hoarding disorder tend to live alone. It's not clear how living alone and hoarding disorder are really tied together. If somebody has hoarding tendencies and they happen to live alone, is there a greater chance that the symptoms are going to manifest because no one is there to stop the hoarding behavior? I've seen instances where a person was married and there was no hoarding behavior and then their spouse died, and the surviving spouse started hoarding after that. Now, that could be because of trauma and distress associated with losing a loved one, but another part of it could be that there's simply no one there to keep the behavior in check. Now, in terms of prevalence, we see that about 2 to 6% of the population has hoarding disorder. There's a significantly higher prevalence in males, but among clinical samples, females are overrepresented. So females with hoarding disorder are more likely to seek treatment. Females are also at a higher risk to have excessive acquisition specifically through buying, right? So I talked about the excessive acquisition and how it's mostly related to obtaining products that are free. Well, with females, they're at a greater risk of going out and buying products 
and bringing them back to the residence. Now moving on to comorbidity, this is when mental disorders tend to appear together. We know that comorbidity is substantial with hoarding disorder. 75% of people with this disorder have at least one comorbid mood or anxiety disorder. 50% have depression, and many have social anxiety disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. About 20% of people with hoarding disorder have obsessive compulsive disorder. So this brings me to another question. How is hoarding disorder different than OCD? With OCD, the behavior associated with that disorder is usually unwanted and very distressing. People don't get any pleasure or reward from engaging in the compulsions. Excessive acquisition is usually not present, or if it is, it has something to do with a specific obsession, not because of a genuine desire to possess the items. For example, if someone with OCD has a fear that their personal information is going to be taken and used against them, like a fear of identity theft, they may keep every magazine that they touch because they're worried that now their fingerprints are on that magazine or their DNA is on that magazine. So they keep the magazines to be safe, not because they think the magazines have some sort of value or it would be wasteful to dispose of them. Another difference between hoarding disorder and OCD is when you see an accumulation with OCD, it's usually some sort of bizarre item, like hair, trash, or rotten food, something like that. Accumulation of these types of items is rare with hoarding disorder. Is hoarding disorder actually distinct from OCD? There's a large debate about this. We know that hoarding disorder is a useful diagnostic classification because it can guide treatment in a meaningful way. So we're better having the classification than not having it. But many argue that it's actually a monosymptomatic form of OCD, meaning it's a type of OCD that only has one primary symptom. Many researchers, however, agree that hoarding disorder should remain a separate disorder regardless of its relationship with OCD. So what about hoarding disorder and autism spectrum disorder? Some have proposed the idea that these two disorders are linked. It's a fairly popular theory. A number of people with autism spectrum disorder engage in collecting behaviors, which of course can be easily confused with hoarding behaviors. And individuals with autism spectrum disorder are more likely to have OCD. So OCD may be some sort of connector conceptually between hoarding disorder and autism spectrum disorder. Interestingly though, there's fairly good evidence that individuals with hoarding disorder do not display more autistic traits than those without hoarding disorder. So it's an area where we need more research, but right now it doesn't look like there's any association. So what causes hoarding disorder? Well, we don't really know. One theory is that if somebody grew up without access to a lot of financial or other resources, they would be more sensitive to throwing things away, more sensitive to potential waste. However, this doesn't seem to be linked to hoarding disorder at all. Now, traumatic experiences do seem to be linked to it. So this is a promising area of continued research. Now moving on to treatment. How do we treat hoarding disorder? Well, individuals with this disorder are five times more likely to seek mental health treatment than the general population. And one reason is the significant comorbidity. So they may be seeking treatment for hoarding disorder or one of the comorbid disorders like OCD or major depressive disorder. Also, when somebody has this disorder, it's fairly obvious to family and friends, so those individuals may intervene and help the person gain access to services. Cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is by far the most popular treatment for hoarding disorder. Much of the treatment focuses on skills training, so trying to improve problem solving, decision making, and organization. There's an exposure component as well, like indirect or direct exposure to distressing stimuli, and cognitive restructuring of the hoarding related beliefs. Another related intervention is to involve the family and to get rid of all the clutter and prevent acquisition of new items. So really this is just a logistical component, removing the clutter and preventing new clutter. This has some clear advantages. Safety, for example, would be improved. But of course the difficulty here is that you have to have consent of the person who has all the clutter and they probably won't be very motivated to do that, especially in the beginning of mental health treatment. Now, some people believe that this kind of logistical intervention is the only solution necessary 
simply clean out the house or apartment or wherever the person lives and that will somehow get rid of the mental disorder and all the symptoms. This usually doesn't work. Typically the individual will have the living space cluttered again within a few months. The mental disorder itself needs to be treated. It's not enough to simply make changes to the physical environment. In terms of overall treatment effectiveness, like looking at something like cognitive behavioral therapy, the good news here is this therapy tends to be relatively effective. So we have fairly good treatment options available for hoarding disorder. So I know whenever I talk about topics like hoarding disorder, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of hoarding disorder to be interesting. Thanks for watching.